Okay, here we go. Your Royal Highness, you accepted the presidency of Save the Children on condition that it would be a working presidency. Why did you do that? Um, well, I, I, it was advice, good advice, that I was given um, many years ago about being a bit more selective about the first appointment that I accepted. And there had been previous invitations, and it, none of them had seemed at that stage, something that I felt that I could go on with, or particularly interested in. And I was, it was good advice, you know, that you, you could choose something which you felt that you could really get involved with. Was working with children something that you had wanted to do? No. And I don't regard children in that light at all. It was more the idea of what you could do for them, not actually working with them, which interested me. I mean, there was no way I could have ever worked, I don't think, as a Save the Children Fund field worker, because I don't think I could have coped with that side of it, actually working with children. But it was the concept of how to help children and the very simple, rather straightforward approach to health and hygiene in, in the worst possible areas. And also the fact that it was still very much a pioneering organisation because it was looking for good alternatives to um, those children who just had unfortunate backgrounds and starts in life. What are the sort of pressures that the field workers are under then that, that, that you say you would have found so difficult? Oh, I think dealing with children, full stop, would have been my biggest problem on a long-term basis. Um, most of them, of course, in, in particularly overseas, are very much more health orientated. So it's a very much a mixture of mothers and children. It's not like running a big playgroup, for instance. But the playgroup workers definitely are fully occupied in looking after small children, and uh, wouldn't have been my idea of fun. The world over, children are the same. Mm, I think very much so. Yes. One might have expected back in 1970 when you became the president of the fund that by now, 20 years later, there might even be less need for such an organisation because as the world develops and people become more caring, these problems would go away. But that doesn't seem to be happening, does it? The problems change. They don't go away. The more developed countries still have pressures on sections of the population for various reasons. And inevitably, it's usually the children who suffer the, the greatest amount of pressure indirectly. Um, and that, I think, is going to be true for many years to come. Equally, the natural disasters are not going to stop happening. So there will always be problems that you have to catch up in the short term and then look to the long term to make sure perhaps you can mitigate the affects the next time round or you know, improve the lot in terms of their ability to cope. The fund, in fact, had a record income last year of £50 million. Will it ever be enough? No, it's like Parkinson's law. I think the, you could always have more money. Every, everybody could and every organisation could. And it's no good really saying the government ought to give more. You could say you could spend everything that you got and more. Uh, there would be no, no real end, real end, to have money that is given freely by people who choose to support the Save the Children Fund and to make sure that is spent in the most cost-effective way to help you, the group of the population that you really want to help, does concentrate the mind on, on the way in which you can deliver that help. And then that's no bad thing. You, in fact, have criticised the British government for lagging behind other developed uh, governments of other developed countries in the amount that they contribute to Save the Children. Why do you think we lag behind? Pardon my arguing with you. I've never said any such thing. I have often been asked the question, of why is it that the government lags behind? I, I don't actually agree with that in, in, in that as a bold statement. I've seen the figures, and I've seen the figures and the effects of other people's aid, and I won't go into it here, but it's the bold figures on paper is not reflected the work that I see on the ground. No, you could always say you could ask the government to give more, but the government, in the 20 years that I've been involved with the Save the Children Fund's attitude towards non-governmental organisations changed quite dramatically. And they've understood how direct the aid can be through non-governmental organisations. And they put a lot more support into them than they have into the direct previous type of aid, which was government to government, where there was no real control over what happened to your, the government money after it was spent. 
Uh, no, I won't, I won't complain about what the government does. Um, they would like to do more. And I know that their attitude and their, the way they listen now to what the NGOs tell them has been a tremendous advantage. Is it not a fact that I, I believe that the, the quotation that I had from you in October was that British government aid is roughly at the same level that it was in 1980, yet that's, voluntary contributions have actually doubled? That's the figures. I don't criticise that. I mean, that's a statement of fact in terms of the bold figures. But it's where it goes and how it's spent that I think has made a considerable difference. And as I say, I don't really want to be dragged into a discussion about how other people's money is spent, but I just don't think it's as good. The fact that voluntary contributions have doubled in a decade, that mm. is at least optimistic. Yes, but I mentioned also that people's awareness, of course, over the last 20 years, um, modern communications being what they are, has increased enormously. I mean, 20 years ago, there was a small section of the population who had travelled a bit, who had seen what was going on overseas, and perhaps had had the ability to travel around the UK and seen what, you know, how circumstances changed within the UK. Nowadays, that sort of information is available for all, and many more people see what's going on. Television viewers are well used to seeing you in third world countries on your Save the Children Fund tours. Yet it's a somewhat surprising statistic, surprising to me, that a third of the fund's money is actually spent in this country. Mm. Yet we're a <coughs> civilised society. What does that say about us? It, it, in that sense, it's not quite as bad as it sounds, because a lot of the work is, is not, you're not talking about saving children from dying or starvation or from basic health problems which, which will cause the death of small children. It's not that kind of spending you're talking about. But every society has its problem areas and pressures. And modern life produces its own pressures. And urban living, very concentrated urban living, produces its own pressures as well. What particularly do you have in mind when you talk of problem areas in today's society? I think you're everywhere where you've got greater concentrations of people, your services are always going to find it more difficult. People get isolated very much more easily. That's partly their own choice in the sense of where they live, but it's also partly the pressures of maybe being single parent families and being isolated from the rest of any support from any other members of the family. Those kind of effects. And just the, the general attitude of, of the society around them, which maybe has become... You mentioned just now that you know, developed countries are more caring. In fact, what we're talking about in the UK has actually indicated that, particularly the young people, it's because the society doesn't have a particularly caring attitude to their immediate neighbours that quite a lot of these problems arise. Yes, in fact, you said in a speech last year that society is setting a bad example to mm -hmm. young people. How are we setting a bad example? I think because it's become very isolated from, from itself. I mean, people tend to work in their own little compartments, don't necessarily look around immediately outside them to see what's going on. And it's so often it's just a question of communications breaking down. The, some of the immigrant families have had major problems. That's partly because their religion and culture has isolated them. The services are there, they exist, but they didn't know where to go and how to use them. And to some extent, they weren't allowed to, so you had to get the services to them. And this is also true of other groups of, of youngsters who may just n not want to be involved. But having said that, I mean, you, you, you tend to end up by thinking that everything is bad news. But equally, the work of the Save the Children Fund is done by a lot of those young people who have got exactly the right attitude and exactly the caring attitude that you need. And there are many more youngsters who are stepping forward and saying, this is what I want to do. So there is a balance there. The, there is a balance which people are beginning to recognise. And every generation, every generation has youngsters who want to kick against authority and don't like discipline. And most children will start off life that way. Some grow out of it quicker than others. You can never tell. I mean, things go in, in, in cycles of the amount of and the type of um, kicking against authority that goes on. But I mean, I, of all people, probably meet more young people who contribute something to the society around them than don't. So there is a balance there. 
You're speaking in general terms. Um, specifically, you're due to go in a few weeks' time to a project in Scotland, which is an alternative mm. to custody project. Now, this is a very specific area in which, presumably, you would like to see reform. Yes, I think for a long time people have considered that for the younger branch, the young offenders, I mean, that's below 16 you're talking about, that custody, if it could be avoided, I mean, it was not a very positive way of approaching um, potential and persistent young offenders. Not, I suppose, because it's considered not a punishment. I mean, everybody, I think, ought to consider that losing your liberty in that sense is a punishment. But the place you went and the sort of people you're mixing with was not a conducive atmosphere to perhaps changing your habits or making you see the light of day or understanding why it is that what you've done is wrong. So that there has to be an alternative to custody. And that's what Save the Children Fund has been working at for quite a few years now. And their approach is very much a one-to-one -one consultation with the young people. So that talking through their problems so they weren't left isolated just to contemplate on um, what they were going to do next, but to actually discuss how they got into that position and why they did it and why they actually committed that particular offence. Now, I don't know that that's necessarily the right answer because I don't think we've been doing it long enough to know what the reoffending figures are. But they have, in some areas where these have been going on, those have dropped. And there are other intermediate treatment centres around the country which are not Save the Children Fund. And again, they haven't been going quite long enough to be able to say for sure that they found a better answer. But the, the signs are encouraging. We're at the beginning of a new decade and at the beginning of your third decade as president of Save the Children Fund. Am I wrong in suggesting that your tone when you talk of our society now is pessimistic? I, I've been a born pessimist all my life, but curious enough, one of the... I don't feel that about Save the Children Fund's work and never have done. Partly because I think the, the way in which it's done, the thoroughness with which they approach their projects and the evaluation which they approach their projects and, and throughout the life of the project, I feel there are, there are very, very few occasions or places where I felt this isn't working or, you know, we're not making many progress. So, I mean, no, I don't think I would, I would regard it that way. Things change. I think the, the general trend is an improvement in all sorts of spheres. It, it's curious, you come back from overseas where you've seen very basic healthcare projects, which are vital because there's been none. And you can lower infant mortality rate relatively easily by instigating clean water and good hygiene practices and extended program of immunization. When you come back to this country, you find very sophisticated medicine, but very little done at the community level, at the base level, where people are actually involved in it. You have to go to your hospital, you have to, you know, the, the sophisticated end of the medicine is much higher up the chain. And there was no doubt that sometimes technology and civilization can drag everything away from the people it was designed to help. Nobody is born with that knowledge. I mean, you may be born with a sense of survival, but you don't know about good health and hygiene. So unless it's there around you, and people tell each new generation about it, people go on you, creating the same bad habits. But that's absolutely fascinating. Are, are you even suggesting that perhaps in the third world countries where conditions are more basic, they've actually got their priorities better organized than we have? We certainly have at the moment. And interestingly enough, in some areas, their, their coverage in terms of vaccination of things like measles and whooping cough is a great deal higher than it is here. How can we then change, in, for the 90s, how can we begin to get it right? Oh, I think it's already happening because or I've already visiting many more um, community centres and medical centres which have been taken back down the chain, if you like, returned to a much more local level. So that already is beginning to happen. I mean, that example, I think, has been understood in terms of... But everything involves people and people taking part. And if we've learnt nothing else through the work of the Save the Children Fund, it's that the people themselves need to understand what it is you're going, you want to do for them. And it's no good just saying, this is good for you. 
Otherwise, they don't come back. For a born pessimist, to use your own words, <laughs> that's a remarkably optimistic viewpoint. Well, you have to work at it, because people given the option tend to sit about. Um, so it, it requires work, and it, that's, that's the difficulty, really, is that it requires everybody getting involved and joining for their own benefit. And that's not always very easy to see. So I think the, it, for that you also need leadership, and that's what, particularly in the UK, a lot of the funds work is about. It's putting in somebody who can lead and help communities understand how they can help themselves. Your Royal Highness, thank you very much indeed.